Vamos a dar paso a la última presentación antes del almuerzo. Eh, llamamos a Craig Labovitz, que va a presentar la evolución de Internet de 2009 a 2019, crecimiento y reducción en simultáneo. El doctor Craig Labovitz es CTO de la unidad de negocios de Deepfield en Nokia. Labovitz es autor de más de una docena de artículos de investigación de redes, artículos de revistas y patentes. Además ha desarrollado la tecnología central, las patentes claves, la arquitectura y la estrategia comercial detrás de un negocio de más de un mil millones de dólares en venta de productos de seguridad para grandes empresas de telecomunicaciones. Great, thank you. So as said, my name is Craig Labovitz, and uh, by the way, it's great to hear about the IRR. That was actually my first project uh, back some 20 years ago, uh, doing the RADB. But uh, today I'm speaking about really the last 20 years of watching the internet grow and evolve. About 10 years ago, we did a paper for IEEE SIGCOM, uh, presented at ITF and SIGCOM, about the sort of first 15 years of the commercial internet, really looking at data from about 100 service providers around the world that agreed to collaborate with us and provide data about packet flows, traffic, BGP data, so we could understand how the internet was changing uh, really from, you know, up till 2009. So I'm back now, some 10 years later, in 2019, with some updates of what's happened over the last 10 years of the internet evolution. And again, the data today comes from service providers around the world that have agreed to share backbone data, traffic data, BGP data, SNMP data with us so we can really understand what's happening between providers and really with this talk about what's happening inside of provider networks. One big change though from 2009 is that this time around we've added information about every IP address on the internet. Meaning in addition to tracking NetFlow, BGP, SNMP data from transit, consumer providers around the world, we're also now crawling every IP on the internet, looking at SSL certs, looking at which CDN is represented, looking at microservices, looking at passive DNS data. So really trying to track not just the internet at an AS level, but really what are all of these IPs that are sending, receiving traffic across BGP, across the internet backbones. So today I'll really talk about four main things that are happening. The internet is certainly getting bigger. Traffic volumes are growing, varies by network, 40, 50% CAGR uh, per year. In addition to the traffic growing, the threats are growing. DDoS continues to grow, the number of interconnection points, and certainly the number of connected devices and the number of IoT devices is now really hitting its stride and growing rapidly. Though the surprising thing too, at least me, is how the internet is getting smaller. Back when we did our first study, Internet traffic to an average provider came from thousands of ASN all over the world. Today, if you look at the network, the sources of traffic for an average consumer, for an average enterprise, are really quite small, and I'll talk about that coming up. In addition to the changing uh, consolidation of content, other things are getting more challenging, such as QoE, traffic, and security because of the way the internet is changing. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about how there's actually some good news in all of this and how router software, silicon, are actually catching up. So I won't spend too much time on this, but this is something researchers love. This is a cumulative distribution graph, which only researchers love, but really showing the percent of, in the first graph, the number of ASN that generate traffic over time. Where the way to read the graph is basically in 2007, you were really about up to 2,000 ASN generated 50% of internet traffic on average when you look at 100 service providers around the world. 
When you get to 2019, this is really different. In most provider networks around the world, in Asia-Pac, in LATAM, in North America, you really just need five ASN or five sites to generate more than 50% of all traffic. Again, really dramatic change. We've gone from thousands of ASN contributing traffic, sending traffic, to when you look at 100 providers around the world, the vast majority of traffic is now coming from you know, under 100, and even five generate more than half of all traffic. This is a very different internet from even 2009. And when you look at what's driving the traffic, it, you know, this is Asia-Pac and uh, data from LATAM. In North America, it's clearly Netflix followed by Google. Netflix is not as dominant in LATAM, at least not yet. But no matter what region you look at, there's generally five to 10 applications that at least by traffic volume are generating the vast majority of traffic. Again, in Asia, it's a you know, video QQ and other applications. But really incredible consolidation of where traffic comes from. And I think the real story is back when we started measuring this. In 2007, for example, CDN were like 20%, 15% of network. In 2007, people deployed Akamai to shave off you know, 10, 15% off of their transit cost. What's happened year over year is the vast majority of paid content, this is video, application, everything, has moved from thousands of enterprises, thousands of different data centers to CDN. By the time you get to 2019, CDN are not in addition to the network, CDN are not an adjunct. The vast majority of traffic now comes from broadly defined one of the 20 CDN. So the network really, the CDN has become the network by the time you're in 2019. So I'll say that really, you know, the internet's evolved from really interconnection to now, at least by traffic volume and by money flows, we've really gone to a traffic video and game delivery system. And we're seeing that even accelerate as CDN build out more and more edge locations and more and more players now are deploying uh, edge caches, on net caches. And network traffic engineering has changed significantly as we've gone from worrying about BGB peering and ASN to now trying to understand CDN and adaptive bitrate and optimizing traffic within markets. And this is just data again from uh, about 100 providers around the world. It varies by region. This is looking at contribution by different CDN. OpenConnect dominating in parts of Europe and North America uh, with their OpenConnect followed by Google's GGC, CloudFront level three. The first uh, four really are all doing major video delivery, which I'll show in the next slide. This isn't about size of the CDN or success of the CDN necessarily, but this is really just traffic volume where the major CDNs in the first four near the bottom are the ones doing some of the major video services. And uh, I think one of the things that really I found fascinating is there's a four billion IPv4 out there. But if you look at a typical network in Latin America, in North America, in Asia Pac, if you look at actually the distribution of IPs sending traffic to subscribers, and again, the left-hand side is showing the percentage of traffic, the bottom axis, x-axis, is the number of IPs. It is really a very small number of IPs on any given day are generating the majority of traffic. In fact, in most networks, by the time you get past 5,000 unique IPs, you're usually at 80, sometimes even 90% of traffic is coming from under 5,000 IPs, which really are the CDNs, the Open Connects, the GGCs, others of the world. But again, this is not traffic coming from thousands of places around the world. 
this is in most networks, five to 10,000 IPs are the majority of your traffic. And you know, the, the other thing that's a little bit interesting too is in 2007, most video was using their own services. Uh, most uh, video and large content was usually single CDN. What's driving this traffic is video. It is streaming uh, Netflix, streaming Amazon, streaming Hulu, streaming iPlayer for BBC. And most of the large video have also now long since moved to using multiple CDN. The way to look at this graph is kind of like the branches of a tree. You'll see that traffic volume before streaming Amazon is split between Akamai and CloudFront. Similarly, you'll see the breakdown for Hulu. So just really interesting watching how the evolution of traffic and content is evolving. The other big thing that's really been changing is back in 2009, we've started to talk about IoT. But the reality in 2009 is if you look at DHCP leases across large subscriber networks, the average number of leases was basically one point something. Now, if you look at number of leases per you know, CPE, per, uh, you know, in some networks were as high as 20, as the number of Xboxes and iPhones and iPads and uh, Samsung TVs and others in the home has really grown. The challenge for this, of course, is we've gone worrying about one device in the home being compromised, perhaps launching attacks, to now 20 or more in individual homes. So really a rapidly evolving sort of security threat as providers look at where they need to have security in the network. So the big things that are happening is most content is now shifting from what used to be transit to metro. Certainly in North America and Europe, we're seeing peering move to actually at the city level uh, with highly dense interconnection, many more CDNs playing. We're seeing significant bandwidth growth on the subscriber edge where we've gone from, you know, what was 10 megabits back in 2009 to a gigabit uh, today in some networks with FTTH. And I think the other big trend that we're seeing in how people are actually building their networks is we've come a long way from 2009 with silicon and software in the ability to manage this rapidly evolving network. And I'll talk a little bit about that coming up. So when we look at the data from 2009, 2009, when we wrote our paper, was really about the shift from transit to basically direct peering. Usually direct peering, though, in just a handful of locations in the major, you know, Equinix location, the major Pakes or, or location. In 2009, the average, give or take, was still about 80% of traffic for providers around the world was still transit, with 20% being serviced by OnNet, Akamai, or other caches, usually just one or two Akamai locations in the network. So this was give or take 2009 was basically a transit-based network. What's interesting is if you look, certainly this is perhaps a little bit more true in Europe and in the US, in LATAM, international transit is still expensive. Uh, we haven't seen the same level of data center and colo build out as we have in other regions. But certainly in North America, we've seen transit drop dramatically as more and more of the traffic has moved to settlement free peering with Valve, with CDN, with Blizzard, uh, you know, with AWS. Uh, to about 80% of traffic now is settlement free or on net and transit continues to decline as more and more of the traffic has shifted to the large content players who are doing direct peering. Though it's not just about the traffic moving to settlement free and on net, it's that the density of peering in many networks in Europe now, they're peering not just in one location, but in all of the major cities. 
Again, we are seeing latency and performance drive the large CDN, drive the large game players to do their own build-outs, really focusing on how close can they get content to the subscribers in each individual market. And this is really is where the action is happening as we look at whatever it is. Edge Connect data center build-outs, uh, it's all now moving you know, into the metro. Where typically, uh, you know, Equinix would just focus on the major national, uh, date, you know, national cities in the past. So a lot of activity around the edge. So certainly the migration of traffic to the metro, to the city level, has had a significant improvement in performance, but it also raises some interesting challenges. For example, previously people would generally just do DDoS on a handful of routers. Today, as you have mobile now generating more traffic, as you have peering in the metro, things like security become significantly more challenging with a much broader attack service. You also have challenges, for example, related to DPI. Now, I'm not going to talk about whether DPI is good or bad, but uh, certainly a large number of uh, providers continue to use DPI, certainly in mobile uh, and also in fixed line for doing marketing, uh, for doing different types of piracy and security applications. We're also continuing to see as the network has grown and the traffic flows have shifted, significantly more challenging to do things like DPI for piracy or other applications uh, in the markets. So I think the problem has shifted now. Some things like QoE, DDoS, DPI are a lot more challenging given how the network is changing. I'll now shift a little bit to not what the problem is, but a little bit to what I think is, is kind of the good news. So one of the really interesting things is that because now the majority of traffic is coming from servers with signed SSL certs, because the number of servers that's actually sending you know, 80, 90% of your traffic is really only about, you know, certainly under 10,000, maybe even under 5,000. It really opens up a new way of thinking about doing security, traffic engineering, uh, QoE in your network. You know, before you always had to worry about with a DOS attack, how do I, you know, you had to worry about tens of thousands of IPs around the internet. Today, whether it be Juniper, Nokia, Cisco, Arista, the amount of filtering capability on recent generation of routers now allows you to do things like focus on those 5,000 routes generating the majority, sorry, okay, major, generating the majority of the good traffic uh, and only then having to worry about DDoS for everything else. So really interesting capabilities as you look at, you know, what's left after you understand the trusted. Uh, and as I said, it also allows you to do things like use the current generation of Cisco, Nokia, uh, you know, Juniper. Uh, the tables are actually large enough that you no longer need dedicated DDoS. You actually can use just a little bit knowledge about the network to install filters all around your border and block the vast majority of DDoS without additional hardware. The other thing that I think is really interesting too is back when we first started doing traffic measurements, it was really hard to get any data from the network. Getting flow, getting SNMP were all hard. The other big change in routers, again from all vendors, is things like gRPC, uh, very fine grain IP fix and sampling. You can now do things like actually track QoE across your entire network just leveraging data from the routers without the need for DPI, without the need for probes. So really interesting capabilities as silicon and router capabilities start to catch up with the changes in the network. And I just have two, uh, maybe three slides left. I'll finish up quickly. So again, this is just a huge advantage. 
If you actually know what the 5,000, 10,000 prefixes are that are the trusted, that are generating the majority of your traffic, and you do still need DPI for piracy, for regulatory, you now can just do DPI on 5% of the traffic. You don't need to look at all 100 gig, 500 gig of traffic. So the good news about the changing nature of traffic really starts to enable all new ways of doing QOE, of doing security, of doing traffic engineering. And my last two slides. Uh, one is in 2009, uh, I was actually quite depressed about V6. And somewhat, uh, I guess, wryly, I wrote a paper about IPv6 had failed. And indeed, in 2009, it was after 10 years of working on V6, it was a fraction of a fraction of 1%. I do think the rest of my predictions were generally pretty good about how the internet would evolve. Uh, this one, I, I was not so much. It does turn out that by the time we get to 2019, V6 in North America and Europe is about 15 to 20% of traffic, largely driven by five or six providers. So this is one area that I thought was, was good news and was quite happy to see. So I do think I'm out of time. Uh, I think I will be out. I think we have a table out in the reception area. Uh, so happy to chat if there's questions and to get in more detail on any of these topics. And I don't know if we've time, but... Muy bien. Muchas gracias, Craig. Tenemos alguna consulta? Alguien de la audiencia, del público que quiera hacer algún comentario o alguna consulta? No? OK. OK, Craig. Yeah, I think there's one. Ah, uy, perdón, perdón, no te vi. <laughs> Dale, Carlitos. Hi, I, 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 I'm doing the question in English because I will repeat it in Spanish afterwards. Thank you, Craig, for your presentation. It was, I thought it was brilliant. I, there was so much information there that um, it will take some time for me to fully digest it. So thank you for that. My question is, and, and this relates to, to the previous presenter, actually, how do you think that um, specifically routing incidents could affect, I mean, or how, how routing incidents could play with this concentration of traffic origins? And is it good, is it bad? What are the, I would say, pitfalls we should, operators should look for? Pregunté cómo juega el tema de la seguridad en rutamiento, los incidentes de seguridad en rutamiento, con la, el problema de la concentración de orígenes de tráfico. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. And by the way, I, I, you know, I started out doing my degree on, on BGP routing security some, some 20 years ago. So I'm glad it's still a, a, a topic. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, certainly it's good to see the work in IRR, the uh, RKPI. Uh, I think one of the important things, to, uh, of course, to recognize is that as the internet becomes smaller from a topology, it really is not important, as important that all 100,000 ASs sign their, you know, 60,000 ASs sign their content. What's really important is the top 100. You know, most of internet content comes from under 100, uh, you know, ASN. This is where the majority of commercial, you know, stuff that people would want to steal, right? The commercial value, content, Wall Street. Uh, so uh, I, I do think the changing consolidation of the internet does make some things more straightforward. Uh, but certainly, I think that BGP and routing continues to be an issue, as it has for all of my career uh, over the last 20, 25 years. Thank you very much. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just one last question, I think. I, uh, Lee Howard, you, um, thank you for mentioning IPv6 at the end. Um, is the profile of traffic, in, in IPv4 you said there's 5,000 addresses uh, where all the traffic is coming from. Is the profile the same in IPv6? Is, this, is there the same kind of distribution of traffic? Uh, is, it, uh, is it the same number of addresses? Is, are there changes? Are there any difference between the two? Yeah, and just to be clear, by the way, the 5,000 varies from provider to provider. Yeah, okay. So it's not 5,000 globally, but it's generally for any given provider, it's a small set for their on-net, for their CDN peers, for level 3 CDN. Uh, IPv6 is really small. 
right? So there's a lot of tail in V6, but it really is just five, all that 20% of traffic is just Netflix, Google, so it's, it's a very tiny set. We don't see the same long tail. So the good news about V6 is 10 major providers, content providers, have adopted V6 to some degree. The bad news in V6 is that's all we really see. You know, there isn't a lot of traffic in most providers in the rest of the tail. But aren't those the same providers that you said were generating 80% of the traffic? Uh, so uh, what, what, what's the question? So, so, okay, so there's only 20 major providers who've adopted IPv6 appreciably, um, but aren't those the same 20 that are responsible for 80% of the traffic? It's because it's the Netflix or the, the YouTube and Google and Facebook. Or yeah. do I misunderstand? No, 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 that's it. I think my point was it's good that we've seen adoption by the major content owners. That's good. Uh, I think what we don't see in V6 is the, everyone else, the long tail. I, I would have thought that the difference, we'll talk at the table, but th yeah. I would have thought that the difference would be the adoption by IoT. If your television doesn't support IPv6, then you're not going to be able to stream video over IPv6, and that's where the content, that's, that would be the difference in traffic profile. But yeah. I look forward to talking more later. Yeah, and again, I do expect this will change, uh, but, uh, but yeah, happy to talk after. So I think we're at the end of time, but thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bueno, uh, thanks, Craig. Bueno, ahora sí vamos a pasar.